Our scripture reading this morning is found in Matthew chapter 18, verses 21 to 35. I will be reading from the New Revised Standard Version. Then Peter came and said to him, Lord, if another member of the church sins against me, how often should I forgive? As many as seven times? Jesus said to him, not seven times, but I tell you, 77 times. For this reason, the kingdom of heaven may be compared to a king who wished to settle accounts with his slaves. When he began the reckoning, one who owed him 10,000 talents was brought to him. And as he could not pay, his Lord ordered him to be sold, together with his wife and children, and all his possessions, and payment to be made. So the slave fell on his knees before him, saying, Have patience with me, and I will pay you everything. And out of pity for him, the lord of that slave released him and forgave him the debt. But that same slave, as he went out, came upon one of his fellow slaves who owed him a hundred denarii. And seizing him by the throat, he said, Pay what you owe. Then his fellow slave fell down and pleaded with him, Have patience with me and I will pay you. But he refused. Then he went and threw him into prison, prison until he would pay the debt. When his fellow slaves saw what had happened, they were greatly distressed, and they went and reported to their Lord all that had taken place. Then his Lord summoned him and said to him, You wicked slave! I forgave you all that debt because you pleaded with me. Should you not have had mercy on your fellow slave as I had mercy on you? And in anger, his Lord handed him over to be tortured until he would pay his entire debt. So my heavenly Father will also do to every one of you if you do not forgive your brother or sister from your heart. May God add his blessing to these words. Good morning, everyone. Good morning, good morning, yes. Uh, well, the last uh, couple weeks, myself included, I preached two weeks ago. We went over time. So today, I promise, we'll, we'll, we'll make it up to you. Um, you know, today's topic, as you can tell from the gospel reading, is about forgiving people. Um, so I know that this message has nothing to do with uh, this church, but we're just going to plod through it anyway. So I know this doesn't apply to you. Um, you know, the beginning says, you know, what, what do I do when uh, my brother or sister sins against me? And, and I know that, you know, the Molnars have been here for decades. They can tell you that no one has ever gotten their feelings hurt here. Uh, so, but we're just gonna we're gonna push through this anyways. I, I want to back up and give a little bit of context for the gospel reading that uh, Evangeline just read. It picks up after Jesus has just delivered some instructions to the disciples about what we might call church management. It's this is from Matthew 18, a passage that I'm sure most of you are very familiar with. It says, "If someone sins against you, what's the first thing you should do? But to go to that person by yourself and confront them about it." And if they repent, then good, you have won your brother. If not, then what? Bring one or two people with you. And if they still won't repent, then what? Then you bring it before the church. And it will be up to the church as a whole <clears throat> to hear his confession and forgive him and welcome him back into full fellowship or otherwise discipline him through excommunication. And it's in this context, right there in Matthew 18, right after this explanation, that Jesus says, where two or three are gathered in my name, I am there among them. Now, we use this often, and I think we use it appropriately to say that whenever Christians gather together, Jesus is there with them. Whether it be here at our worship or in your small group Bible study, Jesus is there with us, right? But in the context, what this means when Jesus says, where two or three are gathered in my name, I am there among them, is he's saying that he stands with 
the church in its decision making. You see, wherever two or three are gathered in my name, I am there with them. I am behind them in a sense. This is in essence a granting to the church the authority to discipline and the authority to forgive. That's the context where Jesus says this. And that's why he says along with it, whatever you bind on earth will be bound in heaven. Whatever you loose on earth will be loosed in heaven. This is a kind of enigmatic expression, but this power to bind and loosen is a power to condemn or to absolve. Jesus is saying, in effect, heaven will ratify your decision. I am there with you. I support your decision. And this may sound very strange to us, but Jesus says it even more explicitly in John chapter 20 after the resurrection. He tells the disciples, if you forgive the sins of any, they are forgiven. If you retain the sins of any, they are retained. Now, why do I bring all of this up? Because the lesson that Jesus is trying to communicate to us today about forgiveness relies on us totally changing how we think about God's forgiveness. You see, Jesus is intentionally blurring the lines between God's forgiveness and the forgiveness that we experience in and through the church community. Now, it's not as if God is taking his hands off the wheel and saying, well, you guys can decide. Now, who goes to heaven? Who goes to hell? It's up to you. I'm fine with whatever you decide. It's not that. But I think the important truth, what he's getting at here, is that the church is the conduit for God's mercy. The church is the channel through which God's forgiveness comes to the world and is experienced by the world. The experience of being forgiven by God is made real. It's made concrete. It's made tangible by experiencing the forgiveness of the church community, right? So that's why this line between, well, God forgives you and the church forgives you, Jesus is saying that's one and the same thing because we concretely experience God's forgiveness by experiencing the forgiveness of others. Just imagine, if you will, there's a terrible situation in which in your entire life, no one has ever forgiven you for anything. Everything you've ever done wrong became this relationship ending tragedy. You've never experienced forgiveness. If that were the case, how could you understand, let alone believe, that God is offering you forgiveness? We know what it means to be forgiven by God because we have in some sense experienced that forgiveness through the community of love that is the church. How could we even hear the message of God's forgiveness if somewhere at some point Someone with a merciful and gracious spirit told you about God's forgiveness. You see, we experience God's forgiveness in and through the experience of the merciful community. So what I hope you gather from this is a tremendous sense of responsibility. We are, as the church, the body of Christ, and that being the body of Christ is no mere metaphor. To be the body of Christ is to be the point of contact between the world and God. It's the Holy Spirit filling the church that makes Christ visible to the world. Jesus says, the world does not see me, but the Holy Spirit will be in you. In other words, the world will see me because the world sees you. You are the body of Christ. You are the image of the invisible God. That makes you something very important. That makes you the conduit of God's mercy, the channel through which God's forgiveness comes into the world and is experienced in a real way. 
And it's this understanding that makes Peter's question at the beginning of our gospel so important. Because if, as Jesus has just said, it is the responsibility of the church to represent the character of God to the world, to represent to the world God's love and forgiveness and mercy, then Peter has to ask this question. Well then, if that's the case, if we are to share God's forgiveness to the world, then how forgiving should we be? How many times should we forgive in order to best represent the character of God. Peter came and said to him, Lord, if another member of the church sins against me, how often should I forgive? As many as seven times? Jesus said to him, not seven times, but 77 times. Now, I know that most of you in your mind are protesting. You saw it maybe on the cover of your bulletin if you read that. It's not 77 times, it's 70 times 7, right? Okay, well, there is some ambiguity in the translation issue. Uh, I will leave that up to you as a homework assignment uh, to figure out if it's 77 or 70 times 7, uh, which would be 490. But I'll tell you this, if you're hung up on the question, of whether or not you should forgive someone 77 times or 490 times, of course you have missed the point, right? Because what Jesus is getting at here is what Paul says in 1 Corinthians 13, which is love keeps no record of wrongs. If we are the means through which God's love and forgiveness is communicated to the world, then what Jesus is telling us here is that our forgiveness must be as limitless as God's. So when we fail to offer forgiveness to others, we are misrepresenting the character of God. And even more than that, we are robbing others of the experience of feeling and knowing and understanding God's forgiveness. God's design for the world is that the world would experience his forgiveness through us. We are the visible, the tangible, the three-dimensional representation of God's love. And so when, when we fail to show that, the whole system breaks down. Imagine, if you will, that I invited you over to my tiny studio apartment to watch a movie. I put in the DVD, get out the remote and press play. And you can hear the DVD spinning. The movie is playing, but something essential is missing. The TV was never turned on. What's happening, right? The movie is playing. You can hear the disc spinning. The movie is playing, but there's no sound. There's no picture. What's missing? The whole experience of the movie is missing. And that is what is missing in the world when we don't forgive. God's forgiveness might be there in some abstract sense. But if the world cannot see it, if the world cannot experience, then what effect can it have? How can anyone believe us? How can anyone even accept God's forgiveness if they never see it, if they never experience it? And that is what makes this issue so urgent in God's mind. Because we are the channel of God's mercy. So this urgency is underscored in the story that Jesus tells. And I'll share it with you again. Uh, he says, the kingdom of heaven may be compared to a king who wished to settle accounts with his slaves. And when he began the reckoning, one who owed him 10,000 talents was brought to him. And as he could not pay, his Lord ordered him to be sold together with his wife and children and all his possessions and payment to be made. So the slave fell on his knees before him saying, have patience with me and I will repay you everything. And out of pity for him, the Lord of that slave released him and forgave him the debt. So now I think about the repentance, the 
the humility of this slave. He even, as impossible as this may be, he says, I will repay. He is acknowledging his debt. He is acknowledging the fairness of what he owes. He says, just give me time. He's not even asking for forgiveness. He's just asking for time to repay it. And one of the important things that I think we have to recognize going forward in talking about forgiveness is that God never imposes his forgiveness on us. God does not forgive us against our own will. What he does is always offers forgiveness. And it is our opportunity to receive it through humbly acknowledging our guilt. If we never recognize that we've done anything wrong, then we can't accept the gift of God's forgiveness. So it's important to clarify this because we talk about the need to sort of forgive everyone. But what we're not saying is like nothing matters, right? So whatever anyone ever does wrong, you just ignore it and turn a blind eye to it. What Jesus is describing here, it does not undermine justice. It doesn't negate the law or common sense standards. God remains extreme in his demands, but he is equally extreme in his mercy, and we are called to do the same, not to lower our standards. When we talk about granting forgiveness to everyone, what we're saying is that we are extending, we are offering mercy to anyone who would take it. But forgiveness is always a two-way street. So we, what we are called to do is, in a spirit of mercy, offer that forgiveness and the church, like God, must be extreme in its demands, but extreme in its mercy. Now this same slave, as he went out, came upon one of his fellow slaves, who owed him a hundred denarii, and seizing him by the throat, he said, pay what you owe. Then his fellow slave fell down and pleaded with him, have patience with me, and I will pay you. But he refused. Then he went and threw him into prison until he would pay the debt. Now, just as an aside, I noticed that the original Lord, when the man couldn't pay the debt, what does he threaten to do? To sell him and his wife and his children in order to repay the debt, right? But this guy, he's just going to throw him in prison. How's that going to help him, right? So. What this guy is experiencing, this ungrateful servant, is simply a spirit of vengeance. He just wants this person to suffer. Now, let's pause and give some context to these two amounts, because I think this is very fascinating. A hundred denarii is the smaller amount, and 10,000 talents is the larger amount. How different are these, really? If you have an NIV Bible, it will say in the footnotes that it's a million dollars versus a few dollars. That's not exactly right. First of all, let's start with the lower amount, the hundred denarii. It's more than a few dollars. This is a significant debt. Uh, one denarius is roughly equivalent, we could say, to a day's wages. You could expect through a day of manual labor to earn one denarius. So to owe a hundred, would take maybe four months to repay this debt. Now, if it takes four months to repay a debt of 100 denarius, how long do you suppose it would take to repay 10,000 talents? Here's a, here's a sense of scale for you. The smaller debt is four months. Any guesses as to how long it would take to repay 10,000 talents at the same rate? H how much? Five times? Oh, a lifetime. Oh, a lifetime. So maybe a hundred years or something like that. 200,000 years. If you're making a denarius a day, working six days a week, 200,000 years to earn that much money. So what's the point here? Four months wages is a significant debt, but it's repayable, right? I wish my student debt was only four months wages, right? But 
200,000 years worth of wages is practically infinite. And that's exactly the point, is that what God has forgiven you, what God has spared you from, is an eternal, unrepayable debt. God has forgiven you an infinite amount. And so no matter how much someone may have wronged you, no matter how horrendous it may have been, it will never compare to the debt that God has forgiven you. So when his fellow slaves saw what had happened, they were greatly distressed, and they went and reported to their Lord all that had taken place. Then his Lord summoned him and said to him, You wicked slave, I forgave you all that debt because you pleaded with me. Should you not have had mercy on your fellow slave as I had mercy on you? And in anger, his Lord handed him over to be tortured until he would pay his entire debt. So my heavenly Father will also do to every one of you if you do not forgive your brother or sister from your heart. This parable only underscores the point we've been making. You see, we are intended to be the conduits of God's mercy in the world. Now, I want you for a moment, I've been using this language, but I want you to imagine this in a kind of literal sense. We have this pool over here of God's love and forgiveness and mercy, and you are this pipe leading up and over and a faucet that is moving, uh, flowing, transferring the love and forgiveness of God. You are the conduit. Now, imagine if you, on this output end, close the faucet. You turn it off so that no more water can flow out. What happens at the intake? Nothing more can come in. You see? The point of what Jesus is expressing is that if we are going to receive God's mercy, it is absolutely necessary that we also share it. If we close ourselves off from forgiving others, we are closing ourselves off from being forgiven by God. So in the end, receiving God's forgiveness comes to us with one simple condition. That's why I titled this message this morning, a tongue-in-cheek play on our website, Grace Conditional. Okay? There is one condition to God's forgiveness. If we are to expect God to forgive us, we must offer forgiveness to one another. And this is the consistent message of Jesus throughout the Gospels. He taught us to pray in the Lord's Prayer, forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. In other words, we are instructed to pray, God, be merciful to me to the same extent that I am merciful to others. And this is what Jesus says in Matthew chapter 6. If you forgive others their trespasses, your heavenly Father will also forgive you. But if you do not forgive others, neither will your Father forgive your trespasses. And later he says, do not judge so that you may not be judged. For with the judgment you make, you will be judged. And the measure you give will be the measure you get. Now, the application of a message like this will look different for each and every one of you. Because for some of you, I know, many of you, when we talk about forgiveness, immediately you know that one big issue. You know that thing that's weighing on your heart, that thing that you have never forgiven. And you don't want to forgive it. For others of you, it may not be one big thing, but just a general spirit of pettiness, uh, vindictiveness, pride. You gossip about others' faults. It's very easy for you to be aware of when people are uh, disrespecting you or annoying you or offending you, yet you yourself are unaware of the times in which you are disrespectful and annoying and offensive to others. So whatever the case may be for you, the invitation of Jesus is the same. We are called to be his representatives. 
We are the vessels of his mercy. We are the ones through whom those around us experience the love and forgiveness of God. So Christ invites you this morning to let go of your pride, let go of your ego, and let God's love flow through you. Because his promise is this, that as freely as you grant mercy, you will receive God's mercy. And the character of God that you portray to the world will be the character of God you face in the day of judgment. And that can be good news or bad news. Uh, it's, it's entirely up to you.